Mr. Landlord. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Landlord. Yeah. All right. All right, now I've got your attention. This is a, an interesting message for me today because I believe it has been 45 years in the making. I grew up in a Christian home in central Alberta, went to the local Pentecostal church, and at 16 I accepted and committed my life to, to the Lord. After that, my father and I would have many long discussions on theology. He was trying to write what he called his theses of how everything in the Bible worked or something like that. I never really did understand it, even though I had to help write or type it and everything. But as a young Christian with this fundamentalist rural Alberta upbringing, I was taught either explicitly or implicitly the workings of a Christian relationship. And one particular area for me just seemed a little off. Not heretical, but not quite right. To me, it always seemed like someone was saying 7 times 13 equals 28. And what do I mean by that? Well, now I will let that wonderful comedian Lou Costello explain it. Uh, Mr. Landlord? Yeah? <laughs> I love Abbott and Costello. <laughs> 7 times 13 equals 28. Amusing when uh, Lou explains it. But when, when it comes to the prevailing thought in the church, not so much. When Josh and I uh, first started talking about the, my next message, he told me that it would be in Ephesians chapter 5, and so I sat down to read it and to give me some idea of what I'd be speaking on. This passage jumped out at me. And Sharon can attest to this. I sat there just meditating on it, contemplating and letting ideas go through my head. I knew this was the message I wanted to speak on. The hard part has been separating the, my own thoughts and prejudices and ideas and seeing what scriptures fully said on the subject and how I could encourage and challenge you this morning. I endeavored to understand it so that when I shared it with you, you would hear seven times 13 equals 91. This morning we're going to focus on Paul's teaching on marriage, a topic that I believe has been misinterpreted, misrepresented, misused and abused by some to exert control and preserve, or to preserve cultural traditions, to the, all to the detriment of the body of Christ. It also seemed to me to, be, to exclude a portion of the body that was unmarried, which is odd since the author was single. As we go through this, my prayer is that for all of us, married or not, we will set aside our preconceived ideas and be encouraged and challenged in our Christian walk. Let's read together. Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as, to your own, as to the, you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water through the word, and to present her to himself a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, the husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one has ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ for the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man 
will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking of Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. The word submit is one of those which has been denigrated by its misuse over time. You'll remember the last time I spoke, the bad word then was humble yourselves. Today the word is submit. Too often when we hear this word, we think of the wrestler pinning his opponent down until he cries uncle. We do this because all too often it has been spoken in a, as a stern command, demanding that we submit to whoever is doing the demanding. That is not submission. That is capitulation. When Paul speaks of submitting, he is speaking of the voluntary act of obedience to God ordained authorities. In Romans chapter 13, verse 5, Paul states, Therefore it is necessary to submit to authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience, which Peter reiterates in 1 Peter 2.13, when he says, Submit yourselves to the Lord for the sake for the Lord's sake, to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority. Submission in this context is the recognition that one's authority is given by God, and therefore we, as his servants, should willingly recognize and follow that authority. Here in verse 21, Paul says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This verse is at the same time a fourth point of the living life in the Spirit from verses 18 to 20. Namely, encourage one another, praising God at all times, being thankful for all he has given, and submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. It is also the general heading of the next three sections on he will speak on, namely the marriage relationship, the father-child relationship, and the master-servant relationship. But he starts the thought, by generalizing it to show that while we, he may deal with only three groups, this letter, this letter, it relates to all mature Christian relationships towards, towards those in authority. For us, it means that the pastor submits to the board because we are given the authority to supervise him. The board in turn submits to the pastor because he has been given God, the God-given authority to to lead this church. The board also submits to the church membership because you are the ones who elected us to give leadership. And in turn, the church submits to the elders because we have been given the authority and responsibility of leading. Submission isn't about power, nor one's intrinsic value. Instead, it is about recognizing God-ordained authority and willingly humbling ourselves to follow that authority. Next, Paul singles out a subset of the church to further his thought, namely to the wives. Starting in verse 24, he encourages the wife to submit herself to the husband as she does to Christ. Let's be clear here. Paul narrows his encouragement to, to submission down to the godly women who are married. This is not a verse that tells all women that they are to be in submission to all men in the church. It is, wives, submit to your own husbands. Why is it so specific? Because the lines of authority are specific. As a husband, I have God-given authority over my family, and therefore Sharon is encouraged to be in submission to me. But I have no authority on any other marriage relationship in, in this church, so no other wife has to submit to my authority, nor does Sharon have to submit to any other husband's authority. So am I saying unmarried women don't have to be in submission to the church? No. As an elder in this church, the membership, our church bylaws, and God has given me certain authority, namely to help lead you as a congregation into greater maturity. And therefore, as we saw in verse 21, the women of the church are to recognize and submit to that authority. But then again, so are the men. Submission isn't gender specific, but instead it is based on, God, on God's ordained authority and our responsibility as mature Christians to submit 
to the ad authority. And, the res- and verse 23 makes it clear that God has ordained the husband to be the head of the family unit, just as Christ is the head of the church. And that, in the same manner that the church is to submit to Christ, so the mature, spirit-filled wife is to submit to her husband. And how is the wife supposed to submit to the husband? Is Paul talking of the traditional roles and norms of the mousy wife kowtowing to her husband's every need? No. He uses the church as his example and criteria for the wife's submission. As the church submits to Christ, so the wife submits to her husband. That is the relationship the wife is to look for as her example. The strong, glorious, victorious church who is in submission to the authority and leading of Jesus Christ, moving ahead into greater and greater maturity, tearing down strongholds and changing the world through her works and ministries, all the while being led in obedience to the leading of her husband, Jesus Christ. This is what a mature, spirit-filled Christian wife looks like, radiant in her purity, holy in her standing, without spot or wrinkle on her soul because she is obedient to the calling of Christ and in submission to the husband God has given her. Excuse me. Now, if this is what a spirit-filled wife is to look like, what of the mature husband? Paul continues in verse 25 to show that us exactly that. Husbands, you are called to love your wife in the same way Christ loved, has loved his church by laying down his life for her to make her holy. Now I've known many husbands who say they love their wife and would lay down their life to protect her and I don't doubt them for a moment. But what about their weekly golf game, their career, or their status in social, in social circles? Paul calls on husbands to love their wife as Christ did. And how is that? Philippians 2, 5 to 8. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on the cross. Jesus set aside his eternal equality in the Godhead and humbled himself to become flesh and then to allow those he created to crucify him, all for the sole purpose of redeeming a wife for himself, namely his church. Not only that, But we read in verse 31 about a man leaving his father and mother. Jesus left heaven to come for his wife. And that, husbands, is the standard of love he is calling each and every one of us to in our relationship with our wife. The spirit-filled, mature Christian husband willingly gives up everything and anything that will lead his wife to becoming more radiant and holy before God. Now this seems all fine and good in a warm, cozy Sunday morning church service. But what about in the cold reality of everyday living? Every time this topic comes up, it's always, I always hear the but what ifs. The what if the husband is abusive and mean or just difficult to live with? Or what if the wife is the pers- proverbial sea hag? How do we deal with these situations? First, we need to recognize that these two passages are separate and complete from each other. That is, they don't rely on one another to validate themselves. The wife is not called to submission if her husband loves her, nor is the husband called to love his wife if she is obedient. Each is called to do their part regardless of how the other acts. First Peter Three reminds us, wives, in the same way, submit to your husband, own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, 
they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Husbands, Romans 5.8 reminds us all that God demonstrated his own love for this, or for his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, the mature Christian spirit-filled spouse takes the first steps to bring the relationship into right standing. They follow the teaching and examples of Christ in their relationship in order that they might win their spouse to Christ through their love and submission. They put Christ and his kingdom first because first and foremost they are submitted to him because of his great love for them. And so they in turn show their Christ-like attitude to their spouses. So am I advocating staying in an abusive relationship just because you are a Christian? No, I would never say that. The above verses are assuming that the spouse is not a believer, yet has agreed to a marriage, or it is an immature Christian who is in need of di discipling in this area. Instead, if the spouse is abusive or criminal, we look back to verse 11 of this chapter for guidance. Have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Sin thrives in darkness, and abuse is sin, and we are called to expose it. Jesus in the Gospels gave the guideline for dealing with those who sin. Paul in his letter to the Corinthian church goes deeper into it, but the crux of it is that the mature, spirit-filled believer does not leave sin festering in the dark, but brings it to light for the express purpose of exposing it, and it, and it is hoped to bring the spouse to repentance and a restoration in their relationship, not only as a couple, but between the offender and God. The mature, spirit-filled spouse wants restoration always, and sometimes that restoration requires church discipline, and even, in extreme and criminal cases, civil authorities' intervention. Not as a punitive measure, but to bring the offender to the place where they can recognize their re need of repentance. The mature Christian spouse wants to glorify God first and foremost and to do, will do all they can to do what is right and proper. They will also see the eternal work, want to see the eternal work done in their partner, even if it means temporal discipline. They follow the God-given authorities all with the motive of seeing their spouse come to the restorative relationship with God. Now, as I said, this passage speaks not only to, the, to just the husband and wife, but to all the church. Let me, as we finish up, show you what I mean. Ask yourself this. Why is there this emphasis on submission and love? Why is Paul so strong on his position on marriage? After all, he was single. The answer is in verse, verses 31 and 32. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. Well, I'm, I'm speaking of Christ and the church. Paul quotes Genesis 2.24, but he shows it through the understanding he has received when he looked at his Torah through the eyes of Christ, and saw that God was not just talking about Adam and Eve, but about Jesus Christ and his church. And this was before Adam and Eve fell. That is how far ahead God has planned this. This union we call marriage is more than just the coming together of a man and a woman for pro the purpose of procreation. Marriage from the beginning has been a model to the world of God's love and his desire for this relationship with his creation. In light of this, let's look back now at, and look at the charge Paul lays on the spouse. But this time, let's use a basic logical principle of if A equals B, then B equals A. It's a simple principle, but one that I think could lead to a profound insight in this case. We read, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also the wives should submit to their husbands. And husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. 
This now we read as, as godly wives submit to, to the husband, so the church should submit to the Lord. And Christ loved the church in the same way the godly husband loves his wife. Do you see what this is saying? Jesus is the standard, but our marriages are to be the models for the church and to the world of God's love. Far from debasing women, Paul is encouraging wives to live up to their position where they are the ones that the church looks to to see, what church, to see church life in action. You are the model of submission to your husband so that we as a body can see what a joy and blessing submission to those in authority can be. You become the model so that the world can see what true submission to authority is and how it is supposed to operate. Church, Paul is calling each and one of, every one of us to submit ourselves to Christ and to live in obedience to him. And we do that by looking at the godly wives in this church. They are our role models. This is how unity in the body is achieved. As we submit to one another out of love for Christ, just as we see it modeled in the spirit-filled wives here. This is what our hurting, divided society needs to see. A spirit-filled, mature body of Christ that serves him in obedience and reaches out to it because of his love for them. Husbands, if the wives are called to a high standard, how much more us? Paul is calling each of us to model in our families the, the love and sacrifice Christ had for the world when he gave himself for it. He is calling us to set aside everything that would hinder his stated purpose of making himself a radiant, pure, and holy bride. We, are, we set the example. We are the models Jesus chose to show his love to the world. This is what a spirit-filled, mature Christian husband does and is. Loving God with all his heart and loving his wife as Christ loves the church. Leaders, and especially us as elders, do we want to know what true leadership looks like? Look to the leadership of the mature godly husbands here and how they love and lead their family. That is the model of leadership God calls us to. One that loves and sacrifices for those God has given us authority over so that they will be even, have an easy, easier time in submitting to that authority and will become all he is calling us to. To those who haven't accepted Christ, Paul is telling you how much Christ loves you and died for you to make you his radiant bride. Do you want to know what the love of Christ looks like? Look at the godly husbands in this church and you will see it. Jesus sacrificed everything he had so that while you were rejecting him, he died to make you radiant. He died to bring you peace and joy. He made a body of believers for you to fellowship and grow with so that he may present you before his father when he comes for his bride. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. This is what the mature, spirit-filled husband and wife are called to do. This is what 7 times 13 equals 91 looks like. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our standard, Jesus Christ, who came and sacrificed everything that he might present you with a pure and holy bride the church, us. 
And Father, we ask that you would give us the strength to model that. Us as husbands, may we model that love of Christ to our wives so that the world will see it. Father, give our wives the strength and willingness to submit to the authorities that you've given. Father, that they might model and show us all what it means to submit and love. We thank you. We praise you. Amen.